it's not a problem. This is the target. Um, so um, today we're going to conclude our discussion of n-grams, and we've been working on the assignment. A long one. Did I say that? Um, I, I can't get them ready on Monday on Wednesday night. It's just not work. I'm too busy during the week. So my apologies. I don't think they're pushing things around, but um, my travel schedule and everything. So what I want to do is just uh, I'll hand out the so I was on Friday when I have all day to think about and then make them do Thursday now. Now, is that okay? Is that good? I mean Wednesday, Thursday. Have a bunch of classes do on Thursday. I don't know. Uh, so in order to accommodate that, I'll hold. I'm going to shift my flights on Thursday, and I'll stay later on Thursday. Okay, so I'll have two hours of office hours on Thursday. Today I'll just be there for an hour. But um, I put all this on the website. I'll remind you. But my apologies to, to um, getting everything worked out. I, I thought I could do this, but Wednesday is just uh, staying up till three in the morning on Wednesday is just not going to work. No. You will have your assignment on Friday. It'll be due to thir thir lucky 13 days later. Okay? And what we're going to do, it's really, I'm having a lot of fun with it. it we're going to do an n-gram model. You're going to test it again. Bless you. You're going to test it against a, uh, a held out set. And then you're also, the thing that I really love, you're going to start generating text. You're going to start generating sentences. And we're going to do that. We're going to do a number of these. Uh, we'll do another one later with uh, recurrent networks. So I think it'll be a, a fun one. So anyway, <coughs> we're moving away from so n-grams. I want to conclude something I didn't finish last time. And then we're going to start to talk about vector models. Now, we already had talked about a vector model. That is, that is a bag of words. It's a vector model. But vector models are really kind of the coin of the realm. They are what everybody uses for words, for documents, for just all kinds of things represented by vectors. It makes perfect sense. Um, and vectors are manipulated by neural networks, so it's, vector models are, are a very significant uh, uh, primary data set. Okay? So we'll, we'll talk about that. And in one particular, we'll warm up by talking about a certain kind of uh, model um, it takes, it does a better job of dealing with things like softwares than just deleting them like we did in the current assignment. Okay? Now, any questions before we move forward? Any questions about anything? We good? Okay. So, let's finish up the material from last time. Remember, the problem is the sparsity of data. Remember what the whole model, the model does. You have a trigram model. What it does is you take all of the sentences in the corpus, you put S and you know the slash the, the, the um, angle brackets S at the beginning, backslash S at the end, just to indicate the beginning and ending. In the assignment and in general, you don't tokenize and you don't do this kind of pre-processing that we're doing in the current assignment. We'll come back to that. It's useful in certain tasks, but, but it's not so useful in others. Uh, and n-gram models are an example. But, but the huge problem is lack of data. You don't have all the n-grams. So, for example, in your training set, this is not this is not a problem with generation. I want to emphasize, when you generate sentences based on an n-gram model, you use the data you have, and you generate sentences based on the patterns that you see. And you're generating a sentence, and you get denied the, and you're trying to figure out what the, rest, the next word is. You look up all of the, say this is a trigram, you look up all of the trigrams in the, in the set, uh, and, and then there's no test set in this case, and you would rank allegations or fourth claims and requests in terms of their probability. And then you, 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 do a, you do a sample from that set according to the probability. So you don't, again, you don't just take the most likely ones, then you don't get many sentences, and then you only get one. 
But if allegations is twice as likely as two denied the allegations, then one denied the report, you're twice as likely to get allegations as reports. What if you sample from the completions to, to the sentence, the next word, based on the probability that that word occurred in the training session? Here's the problem. If you're using this to do other kinds of modeling, and we're not going to do all that much, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing to think about. What if you don't have the data? What if you don't have in your test set, you're trying to figure out, according to your model, how good a sentence is. And the sentence has denied the author. But the probability of that you have denied the and the next word is author is zero in the test set, meaning the trigram denied the author doesn't occur in the test set. It only occurs in the training set. And this is the problem in lots of situations where you where you, you, you don't have a ton of data. You don't if you have trillions and trillions of Trigrams, you're more likely to have it. There's always this problem that you want your data might be sparse. You just don't have enough information to figure out what to do with it. Um, this, this, this occurs in machine translation. Thinking about this, it occurs in machine translation. You, you're translating a German sentence and you get to a word and there's no word in your training set that corresponds to it. There's no trigram that corresponds to that particular thing. It doesn't just show up uh, in, in n-grams. It shows up in a lot of cases that we have missing data. So in this case, we're going to find a way to deal with that. Uh, yes? What do you do when you don't have enough data? We'll, we'll see that neural networks can kind of fudge it. <laughs> they, they, they act in a very different way. But we're doing something very simple here. We're just looking for the trigrams that have that completion. So say you have a bigram with a zero probability of trigram. The problem is that all our definitions of the probability of a sequence you're multiplying because the you know the words occur in sequence and they occur simultaneously. You're multiplying the probability. So you get to a word you've never seen or a trigram you've never seen, and you get a zero. Now you're going to multiply the whole thing. It kills the whole thing. And so that's that's not very robust. You can't compute the probability. You can't compute the complexity. You know you can't divide by zero. So. It, it would mean, essentially, that the perplexity is infinite. But that's not a realistic situation. What you're saying is, according to the training set, this sentence is impossible. But that's not, it's not flexible enough, right? And this is all part of smoothing to sort of smooth out the results so you can interpolate or somehow generalize. So talk about this. Uh, one way to do it is that if you have the entire vocabulary, vocabulary or the entire bigram set of bigrams or the set of trigrams whatever set that you are using as the basis like trigrams these are what's called the all possible trigrams you get the idea it's not just words whatever you are using if it's a unigram model right, it's just words then this would be the vocabulary and this is how many times allegations occur, how many times before. But <clears throat> here is the completion to this trigram, and there's no, you know, there are none that end in this. this. So what do you do? The smoothing here is to get rid of the zeros, and uh, basically you, you take the probability and you steal some from the ones that exist, and you smooth it out so that you have a very small number here. And all of the, the simplest way is you add one to the counts for everything. So somebody remarked on this, I don't know where I was in my alpha training, so we have, we're using
using uh, we're using default dictionaries to store the, the frequency count. And the default dictionary returns zero if it's not there. Well, what do you do? You just return one if it's not there. You assume that if any unknown word or any unknown bigram, trigram, whatever, occurs once. And then you basically just have to adjust it so it looks like a probability distribution. It's just not a, I mean, just so you can use probabilities with the software. For example, when you do a choose in NumPy, you need to have a probability distribution. But I, I think you see the point that you're just going to add one to everything, and everything goes up a little bit, and you've got a slightly different relationship among these, but it's very, very slightly different. So there's a, a bunch of different, me all of the methods that use this kind of technique. It's all about how do you calculate the probability of a bigram, trigram, that you've never seen before. So adding one to all the counts, that's a, that's a very frequent solution. It was invented hundreds of years ago. So basically, when you take the probability, you take the, you, take the, you add one, but then the denominator, you have to increase to account for the fact that you added one to everything in the entire vocabulary. And that's right here. This is the, this should actually be the size of the vocabulary. Right? So this is a slightly different calculation. and then they combine them. Many of the most subtle ways of doing combining. Another solution to zero counts is to use what's called back off. To use less block, less context. If, um, if you come upon a sentence, John likes to play Beethoven symphonies on a harmonica. Very rare sentence. So, you get to so you're just analyzing, you're analyzing the probability of this. You've gone through and figured out, you know, the probability of this, and this, and this. Now we have four, now you've got to play, there's a probability of Beethoven following likes to play, and then play Beethoven symphonies, okay, and then play Beethoven symphonies on, Beethoven symphonies on, uh, all good, all good, and then you hit harmonics. Symphonies on a harmonic. And that doesn't occur. It's a rare sentence. But what do you do? There are, in the training set, there are zero occurrences of symphonies on a harmonic. So back off is say, well, if I can't figure out the probability of harmonica following symphony on a, let me see what the probability is of on a harmonica, that is, harmonica following on A. And you look it up in your training set, there's one occurrence of on A harmonica. So let's just keep thinking about this. What's the, you're backing off from the less context. Instead of using all the less context, you're backing off that, and then you're trying that. And maybe even just look and see the likelihood of the word harmonica. Right? No less context at all. So, it turns out in the training set there's zero occurrences of symphonies on harmonica. There's one occurrence of on a harmonica. There's five occurrences of a harmonica. And there's ten occurrences of harmonica. What do we do with all this information? That's the question. So the basic idea is to use as much evidence. And there's a ton of different people will be talking about this for a decade. Um, so You'll use the whole, say, say you're in a fiber gram, okay, four gram, right? If you have good evidence for this, you use it. Well, there's none of them. That's not good. Zero is not good. Um, otherwise, back off and use on a harmonic if you have good evidence for that. Well, there's one of them. Suppose you have a million or a billion words in your corpus, and you have one occurrence of that. Not a very good sample. Suppose you 
has a billion tritons, and one of them is on a harmonica. One is, you know, you can round the zero, right? <laughs> one is, it's not a very good sample. When you have 30,000 of something in a billion, that's a really good sample. If you have enough, and if you, you, you get the idea. If, you're, if I'm sampling to find out how many people in the room have tattoos, and I ask one person, that's not a good, if I ask nobody, that's terrible evidence. I just guess. I ask one person, we have a statistician here. Um, two people, no, that's still not very good. Three, you know, and in statistics, you learn that when you get to a certain number, roughly around 30 or so, you know, the temporal limit theorem tells you, well, now you, you have a certain probability of having the right answer. And, the more you get, the more accurate your answer is. The question is, how few samples is enough in statistician study? Well, in this situation, one would have to make a decision about this. Is one occurrence enough? I don't know. You have to decide that. And then you back off even further. Use five grams. Is five occurrences of a harmonica, is that good enough? You're, we're getting more of them. The general, you're going to get more and more. Now you have 10. Well, what's the evidence that we would use here. So a simple way to do it is to say, well, zero is not good evidence. So anything better than zero, I will use that. So I'll use the quadrogram if uh, there are any occurrences of it in the training set. Otherwise, back off and look at the, the last three. Right? Use the trigram. If there are any occurrences, I'll all stop and use that. Or you could have a threshold. Right? You could say, uh, one isn't enough, you know? <laughs> and when you get here, you say, okay, that, that's my threshold. So the question is how do you make this decision? How do you use the information about the left context to get the best smooth representation to find some information about the infinite language about how often harmonicas are used to play symphonies of Beethoven? More often than you would think. Um, and, and the entire methodology here is to use the evidence that you have. Yes, Chris. Yeah, so um, let's just say you only find one occurrence of this. Uh, wait, wait, wait. You, you have one of them. Yeah, you just went back. You're trying to use the back off method. What, wait a minute. There, there's, okay. If there's one occurrence of symphonies on harmonica, you might decide that that's good evidence. You might not. So you're saying, okay, one is good enough. Yeah, one's not good enough. Okay. Because then you go to What's good enough? Let's just say it's five then, right? Five. Let's say above above five. Would it and let's just say that so okay, we see the five there. Um kind of like misrepresenting the training set because there's only found one really for kind of asking for five. Yeah. You're you're you you have the ma maximum amount of evidence you have is the four. But you also have all this other information. You could use all of them. And there's a bunch of different methods. Is that your question? Maybe I didn't understand. Yeah, I'm basically saying that. I'm basically saying that like if you only find one occurrence of symphony on a harmonica, back off and say, oh, there's actually five occurrences of a harmonica, so we're just gonna take it. Yeah, you you could just say I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna scan down when it's over some threshold. One percent of the data. Whatever. You you, you could say a certain number counts. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could say good evidence. And I, I can't give you a definitive answer. The, the, I'm going to show you what people do. And there's a, there's a technique that has worked well in practice. And yeah, wouldn't that like misrepresent the kind of Yeah, you don't know how many there are. All you have is your set. Now, there's an infinite list of possible sentences to talk about the real world. And in principle, there's an infinite number of places where people play symphonies on the harmonica. How many of them are there relative to all of them? How often do these things get said in some theoretical instrument? Back off so you have some number of Those happen, but you know. 
see it. And the question is, how do you use that energy? And when you, uh, the typical thing, I mean, think about it. There's got to be more occurrences of on a harmonica than symphonies on a harmonica because it's a subspring. There's got to be more occurrences of a harm, at least as many, of on a harmonica as of a harmonica. You know, so these numbers have to increase, or at least not decrease. So at what point, how do you use all this information? When you, when, when you start with zero, or as you were saying, you know, suppose your threshold is four, then even if there's one occurrence of symphonies on a harmonica, you can't use it, or that's not strong enough evidence to stop there. So you, one of the ideas is to go back and, and think of them, and you know, when you get to one where there's good evidence, bang, you use it. <coughs> and then, of course, we have the situation where um, your training set uh, has all zeros. And the reason is there's no occurrence of a word harmonica in your training set. <laughs> I have an unknown word. How do you deal with that? What, what, is, what do you assign as, you can't say zero because then the whole thing falls apart. I can't calculate. The perplexity is infinite. And that's not really realistic. It's not, it's not robust. You can't just fail every time you, you know, you're talking to when I, if I say something, word to you, you know, and I use some weird, there's a word later, arachnocentric. Suppose you don't know what arachnocentric means. Your brain doesn't explode because you don't understand a word. You sort of skip by it and figure out a mushroom something. So what do you do if the word doesn't occur at all? Well, then you have to come up with some in the training. <laughs> but it does occur in the testing set. That's the whole problem. This is from the testing set, and the testing set has a word that does not occur at all. It's a very rare word. So, in that case, um, a reasonable thing is just to take the number of occurrences of the word in the corpus as a whole. It only occurs in the training set. Now, what you're talking about is how many times does it occur in the training set, and then consider the size of the whole corpus. That's a, a reasonable answer. It may not, what else? Well, you don't have any other information. All you know is that in the whole corpus, which was separated into a training set and a, and a testing set, that this word occurred a certain number, you know, the probability of this word was something. So you use the best information you can. Okay. Um, so what is, what is good evidence? How to calculate the probability using the evidence? Well, one technique is called interpolation. And of course, when there's zeros, you can't use them. They don't help at all. But you do have one occurrence of harmonica, five occurrences of, of a harmonica, and ten occurrences of a harmonica. And you can use all this, right? What you do is you have a weighted sum of the probabilities. You know, like you're going to take 0.5 times the 1 and point. 3 times the 5 and 0.2 times this and add them up. A weighted sum of each of these. And typically, the, you know, more weight for the longer ones and less for the shorter ones. But you use all of the information in some way. And you have these weights. Weighted sum. Um, you can estimate them. People just say, oh, this worked well in the ground corpus. Um, you can also learn them. They haven't talked about learning yet, but you could run the system and adjust those weights. At a machine learning class, you know this is about what it's all about, right? You have, you, here you have, say, three parameters. And the parameters are the weights you're going to give to these. So you run it, you run the corpus, and you train it, and you find out experimentally what is the best set of weights to give you the lowest perplexity on your training set. Um, and then there's something called stupid back off. It's really called this. It's actually an old technique from the uh, information retrieval days uh, from 2009. Um, you just have a, essentially, um, you, you go down and you, you, you wait, you, you take the first one you get to, but you discount it. In 
in other words, one way of doing this is a kind of silly or naive way is if this is zero, go to the next one. And if it's non-zero or if it's over some threshold, you stop. Okay. Uh, maybe that's even stupider back. But stupid backup says do that, but every time you go to the next one, you have to multiply it by 0.4, which means 0.4 is somehow representing the fact that you have less context. And so if, if uh, you want to find out the probability of symphony on a harmonica, and there's one occurrence of harmonica on a harmonica, then um, and there's a million of these uh, uh, million uh, trigrams, and there's one occurrence, then that's the probability of one in a million. So then you, you, have, a, you have a discount factor. Information isn't quite as good, right? You multiply it by 0.4. Where does 0.4 come from? It's in the paper. They tried it. It works. There's no theoretical justification. Okay. You could also learn this, right? But in this stupid backup case, you just stop when you get to the first piece of information that you trust, but you have to discount it. Okay? And the further back you go, the more you just keep doing it. So this is recursive. If you have a, a uh, uh, quadrogram, fine, use it. Otherwise, try the trigram. Suppose the trigram is zero. Then try the bigram. Oh, now you get five occurrences of the bigram in a million. That's five divided by a million times 0.4, right? So it's two divided by a million, right? So that's that's what you do. You, you go down until you get to something that you trust, but you but you discount it for everyone. And, and then there's, there's other techniques. Um, I actually got very interested in this this summer. I spent an absurd amount of time on the days or day. But basically, um, to summarize, just add one smoothing. That tends to work well for categorization. We're going to think about that on, on another assignment. Not so much for language modeling, we found out. Back out on interpolation, um, you can use thresholds. We were talking about you would get the certain threshold and say, okay, now I trust it. Uh, you can learn the weights, use all of them, or have some weights that you set. Um, you can use the stupid back off where you stop when you get the one, but you have to discount it. And then there's there's a more, much more complicated one uh, from 2019 or something. Uh, it's in the text. I spent all this time on it this summer, and I realized yesterday I didn't want to teach. <laughs> it would take an hour to show you. But basically, they combine, it's, a, it's a version of interpolation. But they use, they, they use a lot more information, and the way that they calculate the, um, the, the weights is, is rather complicated. But there's, there, there are other ways to do this. So basically, you back off and use as much information as you can find. You use whatever information you have in the training set to make some projection about um, about the, uh, the likelihood of things that are in the test and that you haven't seen. Remember, you're trying to simulate an infinite language and you only have a finite number of facts. So at some point, you're going to run out of information. Okay. The larger, but remember our first lecture or two, when you have enough data, it doesn't matter. All the methods tend to start working well when you have enough data because you don't end up with these. So in the paper, for stupid back off, they say, <laughs> make an absurd statement. They say, oh, well, 0.4 works really well, especially for really large data sets. Yeah, but everything works well for large data sets. So it's it's not a very good statement. Anyway, so that's how that's how you deal with missing information in this setting. We'll see that uh, neural networks work a little different. Uh, so that's the that was supposed to be the end of last class. So what we're going to do a lot of in this class is think about uh, representations and how to use the representations and how to compute the representations. So basically, vectors are what we're going to use for just about everything. Vectors are what else would you use? It's a sequence of numbers in order. Uh, vectors are input to neural networks. We use a vector 
you know, for the bag of words. Um, so the bag of words model, remember how that works. You have a vocabulary. Okay, and Shakespeare is what, twenty thousand words. Often you would you would use you would limit the number of words in some way, but ten thousand is not an unusual number. Uh, uh, you have a bunch of texts, okay, so here Shakespeare plays, Anthony St. Patrick, the late Jesus, Tempest Man, the late Tempest Man, and so forth. And this is just frequency counts. So you count how many times Anthony, the word Anthony occurred in Anthony and Cleopatra. Caesar occurred 233 times, Cleopatra, 57, and so forth. And the problem is that, you know, they're going to be sparse often, and so we'll use dictionaries. All dictionaries, some sort of way to represent them. But a, a vector, the bag of words, the bag of words vector for the text is going to be indexed on the vocabulary and have the frequency count for how many times those words occur. For now, we just think we have every single word. So that is a vector. That is a vector. And we can do lots of things with vectors. But we have this problem. So this next part, uh, I want to come back to the idea of vectors and vector models and visualize them and think about how to use them, in particular how to think about how can you tell when documents are similar or different? So how can you query and find the result to query based on the vector? But before we do that, there's, there's a typical adjustment that they make to these term vectors. So the term frequency, the term frequency, and here just indexed by the token of the term T and a document of a term T term is the same as word as a term, same as token. There's not a lot of consistency. The term frequency of a term T in a document, D, is the number of times that T occurs in D. Right, sort of straightforward. So here are the, uh, oh, here are the term, this is the term frequency for Caesar in Julius Caesar. Right? So it's just the, the, the number in the uh, document, number of times it occurs in the document. Now, we want to use this term frequency vector, term frequency vector equals bag of words. These terms are, are synonymous. Um, we have tasks such as queries. Which plays, which play talks about religion the most? Or which play talks about religion and the world the most? So pick your favorite keyword. The point is that a query, like what you type into Google, is also a text. It's also a document. It's a short document, but it's a document. It has words in it. And when you type in a query to a search engine, you can make the term frequency vector for the query. In other words, the term frequency vector has a bag of words. It's a short document, but it's still a document. And so que answering queries is basically looking at term vectors and figuring out which ones are the most similar. Okay? And so it's kind of the same as this. Which play is most similar to Julius Caesar? Julius Caesar has a string of term term frequencies. And all the other plays have strings of term vectors. Frequencies. So which one is most similar according to this model? Which one has the most similar vocabulary? But that's essentially the same question as asking a query. I write a little query. It's not Shakespeare. It's not a play. But it does have a term frequency vector. It does have a bag of words. So you're asking, what play is the most similar to my, to my query? Similarity. You can also, in general, say, which plays are tragedies and which are comedies? You can try to group plays by their vocabulary. So this is a classification test. Which, which, 
play groups together that they say the same thing. Or of all the of all the topic, all the articles on the web, I'm looking at an article. What other articles are very similar to this one? Well, you go back to when you made the query and there's a list of ones that are similar to your query, but this is a slightly different question. I'm in a particular place in the document space and I'm asking what other documents look like this one or about the same thing, have the same words. There's no obvious way to get to it except through the query, but one can ask those questions, right? And that's useful. So, what we're going to do is, we're going to compare term frequency. I'm going to keep, I'm probably going to call them term frequency vectors. It's just magic words. We're going to compare these models, and we want to use them for things like this. And I'll show you at the end that we're going to use not exactly term frequency vectors, but we're going to use vector space models for words, for documents using a different model, all sorts of things. Everything essentially is going to be cast in terms of vectors, and we're going to ask these questions. So you could put words, individual words, we'll see later, called word embeddings, in a vector space, and ask which words are close to each other. Good and fine, we're going to be close to each other. Good and bad are probably in different places. You get the idea. We're trying to lay things out in a highly dimensional space so that the vectors are the meaning of the words. This is the key component of modern NLP systems. But here's the thing. Uh, just looking right now at this simple situation, these term frequency vectors, bag of words, um, the raw term frequency doesn't work very well, it turns out. They discovered this a long time ago. 30 years ago, 40 years. it just doesn't work. If I'm comparing two documents to see if they're similar, just using the raw frequencies isn't, isn't enough. And we kind of approached this when we eliminated the stop word in the current climate. Because the idea is that if the word the occurs everywhere, it's not very informative. And so it's a little confusing to say, hey, this document used the 27 times, and so did this document. Well, the is meaningless. I mean, it's useful in a sentence, but it doesn't tell you much about what the documents are about. Oh, the, a, is, you know, those words are in most documents, and so it doesn't tell you. What was the problem with, so we could just eliminate common words. One common way to do that is this notion of stop word. Um, you can take the 100 most common words in the English language and just eliminate them. Some of you notice the problem with that. Let's do with the word not. What's the problem with eliminating the word not? The problem with eliminating the word not? Say again, Yeah, it's a significant word. Not is a very frequent way of saying the negation of something. And just because it's frequent doesn't mean you want to eliminate it. This was a not a good movie. Eliminate not, this was a good movie. It just changes the meaning entirely. So some words are significant and some aren't. And how do you sort this out? Stop words are a very crude way of doing it. It's a sledgehammer, right? We need or squeezes. So, uh, the way to think about it is to think about, oh, and, 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 and I mentioned this before as well. There's another reason. The word arachnocentric occurs in one document. You've all read some paper, right, or some book, and it means all these fancy words. It's in some weird Latin word. Showing off whatever, using arachnocentric instead of about spiders um, is a fancy way of saying that we're some biological term. You know, these, if they only occur in one, a very, very, very few uh, documents, then they're not useful either. 
Because they'll, they might tell you something, oh, this document is completely unique because it uses one unique word. No, that's not a good reason why something new. So the words that are really, really common may not be significant, and the words that are really, really infrequent may not be useful. They're in the middle, like the three bears, right? That's right. No. So <coughs> here's another problem. A document that ten occurrences of a term is, if that term is important, is more relevant than a document with one occurrence. But it may be a whole book, and that's a very small part of the book. It's not ten times more relevant. Just because one of those words is ten times more, even if it's an important word. If Shakespeare occurs ten times more in one book than another, it doesn't mean if you're interested in Shakespeare that the one book is ten times more important. The person just used the word Shakespeare a lot. So there's, there's a bunch of issues here that there's no real simple solution. So <clears throat> and I already said this slide directly. So a term that's rare in the collection is very likely to be relevant to the term to the query, what plays are rational centric? Um, so when, when, the, when these very rare words, that's the other part of, you know, you have a rare word that occurs once, um, but, and I should have said this, if you have a really rare word that's used in two documents, like the query, what plays are arachnocentric, and you're looking for the word arachnocentric, well, then that, that's a tie signal. So a way of dealing with this is to basically weight infrequent words and um, a query term that is frequent in the collection um, is likely to be relevant, but it's not sure indicator relevance, and you can't scale it. So for frequent terms, we want high positive weight more than for rare terms. And so the way that you do this, this is one part of the problem. This doesn't solve every problem I was just talking about. But we use the concept of this is a way of scaling words by how many documents they occur. It, let, let's think of it. This doesn't actually solve the problem. I should have misled you a little bit. It doesn't really solve the problem of infrequent words or rare words. But it solves the problem of frequent words in a better way than simply cutting off hundred most common words. Okay? It's a more sensitive way it uses the corpus. Okay? It does not solve the rare word problem. So DF, the document frequency, is simply the number of documents it occurs in. It has nothing to do with the count, just count how many documents the word occurs in. If it occurs in all of the documents, <coughs> then the document frequency is equal to the number of documents. Okay? And if it occurs in one document, then it's one. So it's an inverse measure of the informative. This, again, doesn't solve the rare word problem, but if you want to solve this stop wordish kind of problem, the document frequency tells you how rare the word is in the set of documents. It's obviously going to be less than the number of uh, uh, Less than the number of, <laughs> the number, I should say, the number of texts in your corpus. And because, and this is, these are things that have been developed. First, they were developed experimentally, and then people tried to justify them, but almost all of these things were just were figured out that worked in practice, and people came along after. So uh, the base of the law doesn't really matter, but they typically use laws to base 10. What you do is, you take this fraction, so how many documents does the term occur in, divided into the number of documents. Divided into the number of documents. And that's wrong. It should be the number of texts in the corpus So if, uh, if this is uh, 1,000, and it occurs in 5,000, then this is going to be 2. If this is 1,000, and this is 2, right? 
then this is inverse, right? And it's going to be 5,000. So um, you do that, but then you take the log. And the log removes that linearity that we talked about. It's not 10 times more important. What this would say is if it occurs 10 times more, it's going to be twice as useful. Right? It's going to be, you're going to take the log. So we, 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 we remove the linear scaling by using the log. It's just a formula. And then, so here's um, a useless example, but basically you can see that as a word, as a word becomes, uh, if a word is used, you know, 10,000 times, oh wait, Very helpful. Um, so for every for every um, for every term in the in the corpus, there's an inverse document frequency which tells you essentially the inverse of the percentage that it occurs in. So then there's a formula. It's called the term frequency inverse document frequency. The dash there is not a subtraction; it's actually multiplication. And what you do is you do log scaling on both sides, and in order, to, in order to remove some problems with very small numbers, you add one, okay? Um, so this formula, you take the log of one plus the term frequency. That's kind of smoothing, right? In a way, you're adding one, it smooths it out, and you multiply it by the log of the inverse document. And the intuition is sometimes a little hard to see, but it's it's actually has found to be very very useful uh, as as uh, um, when you use it for information retrieval in particular. So it increases with the rarity of the term in the collection, but decreases with the number of occurrences within a document. Okay, so you do this calculation, which is just a formula, and you get a different scaling of the. You get a different scaling for the term frequency thing, okay? And that is a, essentially the idea is to is to give rarer words more weight than more common words. The rarer words indicate more of what's going on in the document. So here's the same term frequency vectors we had before, but now they're scaled using the term frequency inverse document. Now, that's the boring part. Here's the interesting. You then treat these term frequency vectors in a vector space, okay? So let's think about what happens if we have, well, let's just say this is three. There's three words in our vocabulary. Dogs are puppies. We count how many times dogs are and fluffy a word used in your document. You have three documents, right? Or a sentence. And let's say dogs are fluffy. Then this one uses dog and uses are but doesn't use fluffy. Dogs are. <coughs> this one uses dogs. Fluffy. This one uses are fluffy. They end up in different places in the vector space. They point in different directions. That's just with three words. Now, of course, you know, dogs are fluffy, fluffy, fluffy. We'd end up, you know, one here, one here, and five here, and it's pointing somewhere in the vector space. So you have a vector, and you just identify, you have the number of words in the vocabulary give you the number of dimensions. This is very high dimensional. It's the size of the vocabulary. It might be a 10,000 dimensional space. That is a vector of 10,000 of these term frequency idea vectors. They're very sparse. Most entries are going to be zero, so they're going to lie you know, within the plane of, of many of these dimensions. But the critical idea here is to visualize that every sentence, every text, every query, any thing you can represent with a term frequency vector is a vector pointing in some direction, right? And there's the document at the end of the vector based on the values in 
in the contract. So, what we want to do is figure out a notion of distance. How similar are two vectors? How similar are two dots? basic ideas, right? Two documents are similar if their vectors are close to each other. So if one vector, in a way it's a though, one vector is uh, Shakespeare is great. And another one is dog, oh I said I was going to win, dog for fun. They're orthogonal. They don't have any words in common. These sentences are completely what about dogs are fluffy and dogs are fluffy, fluffy, fluffy? They're, they're more similar, right? The word, there's more similarity in the vocabulary. So the first thing you might try is the distance between two points. And these are linear algebra notions. You can calculate what is the distance. Each word, you know, is one unit. Uh, and each dimension is counting how many times that word occurs in the term frequency vector. Uh, but the Euclidean distance, the distance from this to this, that's a really bad one. It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that it takes account of, this, of the length of the vector. It takes account And I'm going to do explain. Uh, it takes account of the side, the length of the vector is dependent upon the total count of words in the document. So here's a document that doesn't have as many words as that document. Right? This document is longer because the counts are larger. But that doesn't really work very well. Um, it really takes very significant account of the size of the document. And in most of the cases we're talking about, not all of them, but in most of the cases, it's not the size you're interested in. It's the content. Let's just try a term. You take a document. Okay, let's play Symphony of the Harmonics. Well, let's say that's that's right here. I don't know, the gospel hill or something. That's right here. I have another document. Wayne likes to play Beethoven symphonies on the harmonica. Wayne likes to play Beethoven symphonies on the harmonica. I just I just repeat the sentence. How similar are these? Well, the length is different, sure. That's not, a, that's not an interesting and significant thing because, you know, think about a query. You have a, like a Google query. That's a document. It has a bag of words. It has a vector space model. You want to compare that to every document on the web, but it's really short. It wouldn't be useful, right? Or you have an article which is short and a much longer article and they're on the same subject. Well, they won't appear to be on the same subject if you use the So, what do you do? The angle. We want to use the angle between the two. Here's Wayne plays Beethoven symphonies on the harmonica. I don't know. Wayne, and you know, Russ said it twice. It's just twice as long, right? You added these vectors together. So, not helpful. What we're interested in is to factor out the length. And so what we want is the angle between the two. Now, what does that actually mean we're doing? We could normalize all the vectors to length one. We, you know, you talked about this in linear algebra. Normalize them to unit vectors. And then, then you see if there's, you can do that. Essentially, that's, that's something like what we're going to do. What we're really going to do is use the angle or, not the angle, the cosine. So. Basically, <clears throat> here's the cosine, right? Uh, for zero, this is the unit circle, the 
cosine is the x dimension. So for zero, it's one. For 90 degrees, pi over two, 90 degrees, it's zero. For pi, or 180 degrees, it's negative one. It's the x dimension of the unit circle. And for 270 degrees, it's again zero. This gives us the metric. One is identical. Negative one is complete opposite. And zero is orthogonal. There's no comparison between them. That's how it's going to be used. So there's a formula. And you might remember or not from uh, linear algebra. Uh, you can figure out the cosine of an angle for two vectors by taking the dot product, then taking the sizes, normalize basically the B and the double bars on the B, that's the length of B, the norm. And when you divide it by its length, it shrinks it to a unit vector. So that B, length of B, is a unit vector. A, norm of A, it, that's a unit vector, and you take the, the dot product. And you can also use this one, right? And what that does is, on a unit vector, it gives you the cosine. Okay, so basically, you have eliminated the length by normalizing by turning it into unit vectors. And so you get the cosine of the angle between from the vectors. So remember, remember, each one of these is a term frequency model. You're going through and taking the frequency counts, and you're taking the frequency counts, and you're multiplying them all together and adding them up, and that's the dot product, and then you divide by the length. And what it's going to tell you is, if the cosine is 1, these are the same document. But what do I mean by the same document? I don't mean that the counts are exactly the same. I mean that the proportions are the same. If you normalize them, right, so that they all add up to one or something, they'd all be identical. It just factors out the length, right? One is identical. Negative one is the opposite, okay? Um, it doesn't really occur because we have positive counts, but there are other vector models where you have all four quadrants. But we don't have negative occurrences of work, right? But in a other kinds of vector models, you could have all four quadrants because you could have parameters that are negative and positive, right? But for us, what we're interested in is between zero and one. So the vectors can only be in the first quadrant because the frequency counts are always positive or non-negative. And so here's a document, here's a document, here's a document. You know, so to get the how similar these documents are, this could have been off this direction, this could have been short, but we normalize them to be the same length. Here's the angle, we take the cosine, and the angle, when it's the same, right, if we take this and shift it down, and this is one of the documents, we can see where the other document is. This document, it has the same exact percentage of words. Everything's the same, in percentage-wise. And then when it's up here, there's the, 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 the cosine is zero for 90. There's no similarity. They have no occurrences of the same location. And you just, this is just a formula. Okay, I'm going to end a little early here. I, let's talk a little bit. So one can, um, one can build these kinds of documents kind of vector space models. Uh, here is one, there's a few differences with what I just described, but the point is the same, is uh, all of the plays of Shakespeare. And I've labeled them with colors, so all the, uh, all the history plays together, uh, the, the um, tragedies are spread out, the uh, green are the comedies, they're close to each other. You can place them, you're going to create something much like this. You can place all of the plays in a vector <coughs> space. You might ask yourself, 
player. Build it in a 20,000 dimensional space, and you do all the measurements in that space, but then you can collapse it down using linear algebra techniques to show it in two dimensions. Um, you can do a vector space for a word, a word embedding. This is done a little, I'm just showing you the general idea of these vector spaces. Uh, this is an individual word. Uh, it's not amenable to the kind of term frequency uh, analysis. But if you could characterize a word in terms of, oh, 200 or 300 dimensions on its qualities, is it positive, is it negative, is it aggressive, is it passive, is it blah, blah, blah. Find 200 different ways to characterize words and measure them. You could put them in a vector space. So you might find that green and red and color all end up in the same direction. Uh, you might find that wave and waving end up very similar to each other. Uh, car and auto and vehicle end up close to each other. And that's a word in there. Now, we don't exactly do it by characterizing words in terms of their qualities, we do it by looking at the way that words are used and what, what their context is. So a word like car tends to be used a lot next to things like drive and road. And so what we'll do is, this is a long discussion that we're going to have later, is we're going to characterize words by the context that they occur in. Something like engram. What context does a word car occur in? It follows certain words in our corpus. Well, we're actually used the following. We'll use the preceding, we'll use the following. It's called skip gram. Instead of an engram just the beginning, we'll also use words at the end. And you can characterize what words sort of tend to be surround a given word, and you can give it a vector interpretation. So words will be put together if they tend to be used in the same context. And a word like car and auto might be in almost exactly the same place because they're essentially If they tend to be used in the same exact context, they'll end up in the same place. Not so close. Aircraft is also something that travels and it's a vehicle, but it's not quite, it's not used in exactly the same way. So with this notion of a word embedding, which is what all modern NLP systems are based on will be important. Oh, this is the this is the idea of the query, right? So you have uh, uh, however many dimensions you have, you have a whole bunch of documents, and you send in a query to some little short thing, right? Uh, regular expressions in Python, and it uses those. That's the query, and it builds a bag of words, a term frequency vector, and then your problem is you've got to find the document that's close to that. And you know there's some subtleties there because you don't want to just search every document to take this one. But the, the, if you have a query, the documents which are closest to your query document are answers to your query. And that's how Google works. There's a ton of other stuff behind Google, obviously. But this is a simple way to think about what Google does. And yeah, I mean, it can be used for all, this kind of idea can be used for all kinds of things, for quantitative models. Uh, this is some kind of measurement of, I don't know what the dimensions, what the, the dimensions are, but in three dimensions, uh, you can take characteristics of just about any kind of data and put it in a vector and apply these techniques. It's a very, very general technique because the idea of a vector representing Features of some object is a very, very general Okay, better. We don't have negative one. <laughs> we only have one there. We'll, 
one plus. And you only have one plus. In two dimensions, you only have something. Now your, your question is, what, what do I mean by opposite? Um, I, I, might, I might have given you too much information and I confused you, but basically, uh, in general, for quantitative models, vector modeling is a huge subject in many fields, but um, you, you, could have, you could have two qualities, right? One could be happiness and the other could be Aggressive. <laughs> and you would have positive happiness or negative happiness, right? I mean, you could, you could force this into, a, into, into all four quadrants. And then you have aggressive and not aggressive. And you could take a statement and rank it in terms of how happy or sad it is. Happy, sad, aggressive, passive. And you could rank it, and it would be somewhere in this space, depending on the measurement of those two. So you could have positive and negative. But it just corresponds to the cosine in a geometrical sense. But my point here is that we are only counting document term frequencies, and they're ne never negative. You only have, this is in two dimensions, you only have this quadrant to work with because all of the counts are positive. But it is possible to create, and then we'll see later with these embeddings, you might have negative numbers and then they're all over. You can take two words that are opposite to each other because they're cosine the same. But in this setting, in the setting of you know, document frequency, you never have a negative document. Does that make sense? I, I think I didn't. I confused you. Hard to find something that's opposite. If if you had a if you had a term, call it a term frequency vector, because frequency has to be positive. But if you had a vector model for something which includes positives and negatives, then you could speak of opposites. Happy, sad, depressed. But you have to have a positive and a negative scale in order to have opposites. In this one, they're all positive. You only have one quadrant, so the cosine goes from one to one to zero. Your measurement of how similar documents are is from zero to one. One is identical, zero is no relationship whatsoever. There's no relationship between the words and the words. They use disjoint vocabulary. You know, one means they use the same percentage of the same word, normalized for length. Somewhere in between, some words they use the same, some are not. Okay? Don't consider all of the words? Or order. Oh, order doesn't matter at all. Order doesn't matter. But the dimensions are, are not relevant. Oh, so in this model. It is possible to have a vector space model that has. And not in this case. Most of them it doesn't matter. It's just like in a neural network. The input, the order of the inputs typically doesn't matter because it's the system will figure it out, right? Um, in this setting, the order doesn't matter. But wait a minute, you have about here is vocabulary being words or bigrams or trigrams. The order in the n-gram is not what this is about. You could, you could. You could. Those, it's interesting. Models using order, or, you know, they tend not to be we're going to get into sequence models. This, this model is just about counts. But the count could be bigrams. You could have a bag of bigrams. And you could compare the two documents on their bag of bigrams. And 
Now you're counting something that's obvious in the order of the words you count. Let's stop here. Um, okay, assignment due tonight, uh, and I'll be in my office for an hour, and then we'll get another assignment on Friday. Apologies. Gotta hate these damn things. Some sort of uh, PCA or SVG to get to the three dimensional. Uh, no, no, no. What PCA does is just collapse down the, the, the dimension and it uses it uses the one that's the most sure. So you see the most. Thing. You do some sort of composition to get to the two dimensional thing, and that we kind of that happens between the slides. Is that what happens? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what. Yeah. That's what. Uh, that's how you get to. Well, that's how we got there. So this, yeah, yeah. yeah. So somewhere, so before now this, this is actually based on a word embedding. Yeah. The word embedding is not charged, positive and negative. And then for every place, every word in the middle, you add them all together. You can't take anything out And then these are all then placed in a vector space. The comedies ended up together, the histories ended up sort of near each other. Um, <laughs> Okay, so okay, then my mind is left closed. This is not the result of the PF idea. So the composition, this is word of it. So cool. Thank you. Yeah. 
Jack Sparrow. Oh, that's 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 that's
You're worrying about getting rid of the colons. You do want it, well, if you want to get rid of none of the colons, that's probably fine enough because I sort of said that in the assignment. But if you want to get rid of the colons, then here's a way to do it. Take, take the first, what, what, what do you know about the colon that follows the name? It's, it's, it's at the beginning of the sentence line. Yeah. There's two words, and then there's a colon. In fact, the names are all in capital letters. But what you could do is say the pattern could be the pattern could be this, right? The pattern could be beginning of the line, any number of characters and then a colon. Right? That gets a colon. It gets it any one or more of any character, period. Right? And this says it's at the beginning of the line. So beginning of the line, this first colon is very definitely. Every line looks like that. But isn't this like beginning of the whole No, it's beginning of Oh, oh, well, I am assuming, yeah. Well, I'm assuming you kind of did the line. If you have all the lines you did it with. You do this at the point where you have the, um, the line. Yeah, well, then you can do this. And I guess you could do... Matt, do you want this table? I usually move it. This one here. Oh, this one. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. No, because I don't, I don't are you making recordings? I'm not making recordings. Oh, yeah, I make recordings, and you can't pick up the voice over there, so I, just, <laughs> so I move everything over. Okay. Thank you. 